Uh, Dana Green is a, a lifelong activist. She um, and I actually came up uh, together in some street activism in New York City in the early 1990s, including Women's Health Action and Mobilization, otherwise known as WAM, and ACT UP. And we worked in an um, a autonomous community health project called Community Health Project that was in the Lesbian Gay Community Center on 13th Street, which has now become Cal Lord. And we've been sort of following each other in, um, and we actually, we, um, as I said to my class, we, um, we, through our AIDS work, we ended up at Bedford Hills Prison, which is a, um, a medium, is it medium or maximum, maximum security prison, uh, just uh, 20, 30 miles up the road in uh, Medford, in Bedford, which is um, in Westchester. Um, and so Dana has gone on to uh, do really amazing advocacy against the stasis of penal reform and uh, works, has worked for the past eight years, is that right? In uh, uh, at, um, NMSU, New Mexico State University, which is in Las Cruces, which is right near the Mexican border. Um, she, one of the other uh, really interesting things about Dana's work is that, uh, is that she has a really interesting analysis of what it means to uh, move from street activism into the institution and back, and the, the relationship of those two things. Um, which she may or may not get to naturally through this tour, but um, it's been with something that of MFA and writing and activism has been particularly interested in. I'm really delighted to have her. These images are really striking. You'll, you'll notice, and I think that Dana will talk about, uh, the fact that there are um, not bodies in, um, in her images, and no human bodies in the images, and uh, that critique of photography and prisons is fascinating to me and really, really important. I hope so my PhD is in criminal justice. My specialization is the history and philosophy of punishment in the United States. I tell you this only to understand that my training is academic, not uh, artistic, and that that has become increasingly um, problematic for me. That um, in my field, in the field of criminal justice, even the most reactionary scholars, right-wing wing nuts, will tell you that what happens in the United States by way of prison and punishment is absurd, is surreal, is mean, is racist, is not okay. Right? So that and, and so that there is not what there's ample articles and documentation and books about this. So uh, my interest and why I began studying this was for me the prison is a nexus of state power, of uh, our manifestations of ideas about race, about power, about class, about the role of the state and its relationship to the citizens. So for me, it became a site of activism that I imagined the rest of my life. And what I can tell you is, historically, and there have been many efforts to try to reduce punishment in this country, they've all, in fact, grown punishment. So, I'm, so I, uh, for a lot of reasons, for my own personal um, vibrancy and also in the interest of activism, have moved to working with images. So I traveled the entire state of New Mexico and went to every adult correctional facility. I traveled over 4,000 miles. I live in Las Cruces, which is right there. Dan gave me this technology, I'm really into it, so if I overuse it, I apologize. Um, but that's where I'm from, so I traveled everywhere. As you see, the prisons are all over the state. Uh, all the ones with red lettering are state-operated, and all the ones in blue, which are five, are private. So we have 11 adult correctional facilities in New Mexico. Five are private. That's three separate corporations for those five, pri five private prisons, and I will talk about that. Um, in my teaching and in my living and talking to people as they find out what I do, it's become very clear to me that people don't really understand what a prison is. And so my enterprise of taking these photographs was in the hope and the belief that the disruption of mass incarceration will come from the masses when they realize what a prison actually is, what kind of infrastructure, what kind of resources, what it means to make these institutions and to sustain them. So um, prisons are, um, lately I've been calling them disappearance factories or factories of surveillance, they operate 365 days a year, seven days a week, every minute of every hour of every day, all across the country. So, um, so my pictures are in the hopes of, of helping people to understand just the nature and the scale of the infrastructure that is a prison. Um, most prison images for the life of the prison actually have been state generated. So most of the pictures you've probably ever seen of a prison were made by the state or the feds. More recently, this has become 
uh, an attractive area in which people have begun to make art or images. Uh, journalists who on and off throughout our history have been allowed or disallowed access, that always means the state really controlled that image, where they went, stuff like that. But it also, journalists tended to replicate the kinds of images the state was already making. Now, artists have taken, in many respects, a very different approach. But I am proposing, I've been very troubled by the vast majority of prison images that I have seen probably in the past eight to 10 years. Um, I am proposing that prison has become the new dark continent. So colonists use the phrase dark continent to talk about the continent of Africa and also to communicate uh, the idea of savagery, of primitiveness, of uh, erotic desire and of othering, and that um, the enterprise of colonialism was also about cataloging and documenting bodies. And so much of the prison imagery that I've seen, I think, traffics in this. And the scholar in me is troubled by these images. They are often without context and without history. So my pictures have no people on them. That's deliberate. And as you see, I will be reading and talking to you. It is also my aim to contextualize and historicize what we're looking at. So it's very, very important to me. Um, I don't know what happened. What was that? Change it. Um, in the 1990s, a prison was built in rural United States every 15 days for 10 years. Wow. If you are a prisoner on planet Earth, there is a one in four chance you are in a US prison. I will say that again. If you are a prisoner on planet Earth, there is a one in four chance you are in a US prison. 25% of the world's prisoners are in US prisons. Yet, most people can only guess what transpires in, what, in these liminal spaces. I'm gonna read something to you that I wrote. Frontier. Defined variously as a territory that forms the furthest extent of a country's settled or inhabited regions. An outer limit, a borderland, which in turn is defined as an indeterminate region. These phrases aptly describe prisons, scattered as they are on the outskirts of geographical space and delineated by physical boundaries meant to conceal and disappear. Like many fantasies of place, prisons loom large in our individual and collective imagination but are rarely located in the physical world. New Mexico, where I live and work, is fixed in the national imagination almost exclusively as landscape. By using the land of enchantment as a case study, my project complicates iconic scenery and insists a relocation of prisons from the illusory to the real. The borderlands that are our nation's prisons are nether regions where people reside in interstitial spaces between citizen and exile between constant surveillance and forgotten invisibility, where the work of punishment done in all our names is hidden from our view. I hope to create a new visual language of correctional facilities that refuses to traffic in fear or titillation, but generates realistic pictorial prisms from which to review or to surveil incarceration. I call these images prisonscapes that, in the hope to marry the artistic tradition of landscape imagery with my aim to place prisons in a material and geographical context. The images, um, they show everyday prison realities, and you'll see a lot of repetition, and I'll tell you why. But the quotidian is macabre when on the inside. Because they are out of sight, few ever think of the mundane functional necessities of the scale of infrastructure and bureaucracy associated with the operation and maintenance of a penal institution. Four of the prisons that I went to are on Route 66. This is a source of luring a lot of people to travel the roadways of New Mexico. New Mexico is home to um, the Manhattan Project in Roswell, of course, Georgia O'Keeffe. Our population is just over 2 million. We have the highest off-pad prescription drug use in the nation, the highest teen pregnancy rate in the United States. We have a push-out rate, what some people call a dropout rate, of over 50% in our high schools. Um, in 1980, the worst prison riot, the most violent prison riot in the United States happened in New Mexico in the Santa Fe Penitentiary, which is about a mile past this side. Uh, in, because of that, uh, we're under a consent decree and every prison in 
in operation today in New Mexico was built after 1980. That is very, very rare. New Mexico, this is on the Turquoise Trail, another important um, part of New Mexico tourism. New Mexico spends 4.7 times per prisoner than it does for a student in a public school. One in four New Mexicans is food insecure. New Mexico is the number one food desert in the United States. One fifth of all New Mexicans live below the poverty line. And the rank of the state of New Mexico's children is 49th out of 50th in the nation. Our school system ranks 49th or 50th depending on the year and what's happening in Mississippi. So this is New Mexico. Corrections Corporation of America and the great beautiful New Mexico sky. This is uh, the largest international prison uh, corporation in the world, and they run prisons in New Mexico and elsewhere. So also a corporation, an international corporation, and one running several prisons in New Mexico. Notice the cactus, so it's like, it's like we're going to New Mexico together. The beautiful New Mexico red earth, um, our beautiful sky, these are biohazard canisters. They do have biohazard in them. There are rocks on top of them because it's very windy in New Mexico. And this is an area that used to be a yard for the inmates, and now it's where they store biohazard waste. So many people think of Georgia O'Keeffe and the great beautiful light that shines in New Mexico and our sunshine. So mm -hmm. I include this to take a look at our sunshine. These, uh, there's sand and dirt inside of this, and it's where snipers up in the corrections officer's towers fire a warning shot. One shot into the sand, and then they can shoot you. Here you see our beautiful lights. This is New Mexico. Prisons have double fences. People don't always realize. Um, this, of course, is our beautiful light, and this is sunset in beautiful New Mexico. Uh, they are, those are sensors that will sense any motion, but of course we have bunny rabbits, um, so they go off all the time. <laughs> and so um, there's also a perimeter outside of this second fence that a truck is always driving 24 hours a day. That's somebody's job to drive in a circle around the prison. And they are free to shoot you. They cannot shoot you. Oh, I'm so sorry. They cannot shoot you if you're touching the first set um, fence, if you're here. But once you touch that fence, you can be shot. Escapes are very rare in U.S. prisons. And most people go to their mom or their lovers, so they're easy to find. Um, Every prison in New Mexico has a sweat lodge. It is a federally mandated that a recognized religion um, must, must be afforded all the tools to practice that religion. The needs of the institution always do uh, precede the needs of the individual. The religion is considered, has been ruled by the Supreme Court of Constitutional Right of um, inmates in U.S. prisons. Um, we didn't have any, prisoners didn't have any constitutional rights until actually 1966 was the first case that said constitutional rights do apply to incarcerated people. Prior to that, ruling in 1871 said they're slaves to the state and there were no constitutional rights. In order to practice the sweat, the sweat happens twice a week, uh, you have to have a native, an official Native American number, which means the federal government has acknowledged you as Native American and it means a tribe that the tribe to which you belong has been federally recognized by the federal government as a tribe, and you have proven by whatever parameters that tribe requires that you are indeed a member of that tribe. The prison will help you to do that if you have not gone through that already. You may have grown up on a res or whatnot. Um, uh, yeah. The most prison, I mean, most. Um, Native American tribes still use blood quantum as a way to acknowledge tribal membership. So it's very complicated and to prove your lineage and all that jazz. So um, Where's the here. Sweat huh? Where's the sweat lodge? So uh, here's another one. This is another one, of course, the beautiful New Mexico scenery. So um, the sweat you will, they'll heat up rocks. The rocks get very hot. They'll put tarps over, uh, blankets over the, that, the structure um, that's right here. And um, the rocks will be heated up, and you'll go and sweat for cleansing and to have clarity of mind. And um, so it's a ritual, and it's for the well-being of your spirit and your heart and your mind. Um, some of them, so this is not atypical for ones that are sweat. Some of them 
Um, and this is all at the discretion of Gordon. I agree to perhaps grow corn and, um, and have elements that they also want to include in the ritual. There's usually some pathway by which to um, run water. And, uh, but again, the prison doesn't have to give you X amount of square footage. And as prison's needs change over time, year to year, this will get maybe reconfigured. And the MTC prison that I showed you, they're the most recent prison in New Mexico. And they said, well, we're not going to have a sweat lodge. And they don't have that option. This is, you have to um, have a sweat lodge if you're going to have Native Americans in your prison. So um, this is another one, of course, for New Mexico. Here's another, this is yet a different sweat lodge. We get monsoon rains in New Mexico, and the prisons are not uh, really prepared for them. So this is another sweat lodge, the structure we right there. Each one of these, I have lots of, it may look like duplicates to you, and we can talk about that, but what I want you to understand is every prison, everywhere, all the time, every day. So my choice to show multiple images, these are from different prisons, is to help you begin to wrap your mind around the scale of what we're talking about. Remember, every 15 years a prison opened for an entire decade in rural America. So this is what rural America is comprised of. This, I, I don't know where to begin. <laughs> um, so we can begin together. This is a private prison. The fence <laughs> was the, the warden's idea. And uh, obviously some money went into it. It does not go all the way around the prison. It sort of stops at the end of either end of, of you know, it sort of stops right around there and also on the other um, side. Uh, I don't know who this is for and I welcome your thoughts about it. Um, is this, if you're visiting uh, a loved one in prison, is this supposed to be cozy? This is not what prisoners see. They come in through a different entrance and through buses. Um, if you work there, so I asked the folks that work there, I was like, what's with the fence? And they were like, yeah, what's with the fence? So that was as far as that got. And everybody was laughing about it, um, but here it is. And the warden um, was very, very proud of the fence. These are exercise cages and, of course, the great, beautiful red uh, New Mexican earth. If you are in maximum security prison or have been designated the classification of maximum security in New Mexico, which is classification six, we have a one through six classification system, this is your one hour outside a day. That is true around the country. Uh, anecdotally, the correction officers refer to this as Jurassic Park. We have to bring them to Jurassic Park now. That's how it's referred to. You um, are brought out to its one person per cage, your handcuff. You're put in there and you put your wrist through there and we'll take the handcuffs off. There's often nothing in the cage. Sometimes there's a basketball. Um, okay. I'm gonna do a little reading. This is a conjugal visit trailer. Conjugal visits were first allowed in Mississippi's Parchman State Penitentiary, a 20,000 acre former plantation that became a penal farm in 1901. It is still in operation. In the wake of the Civil War, the South was in ruins. There were also no prisons in the South. Um, obviously, things were dealt with on the plantation. There was also an agricultural-based uh, economy, and prisons really were an idea and a practice in New York. There were a handful, a very small number of prisons. They were port cities in the South, and they were no longer standing at the end of the Civil War. Uh, allegiances were forged after the Civil War between whites across social classes, which was not typical prior to the war. The criminal law and new punishment practices were used to reinstate the economic and social conditions of slavery. Prior to Jim Crow were a set of codes called the Black Codes. They emerged right after the Civil War, and they criminalized the behavior of newly freed African Americans, such as owning a weapon, being homeless, or killing a pig. White people were free to engage in all these behaviors and many more. The black codes are extensive. The list is extensive. White people did it. It was not a crime. Black people did it. It was a crime. Thus um, began, in my opinion, the structural creation of a black criminal class in the United States. There were no prisons to put these folks in. So this began the emergence of chain gangs, uh, convict leasing, which we can talk about if you don't know what that is, but I'm going to keep going. And the penal farm emerged to manage the now growing ranks of black prisoners. In the early 1900s, the warden of Parchment Farm began bringing in prostitutes on Sundays to keep the prisoners sated and compliant. It was believed that their animalistic nature would emerge and they would become difficult to control and they would no longer work if they didn't have a sexual outlet. 
This was only for black convicts. White people did not get conjugal visits until the 1930s. The story of conjugal visits in America is in part the, the obsession and fixation of white America on black sexuality. Um, if you've ever heard that song, The Midnight Special, if you guys know that song, that's about prostitutes and wives going to Parchment Farm on Sundays to engage in sexual activity. So this is a conjugal visit trailer in the state of New Mexico. This is a conjugal visit at a different set, uh, trailer at another prison in New Mexico. This is a conjugal visit trailer at another prison in the state of New Mexico. This is another conjugal visit trailer in the state of New Mexico. I show you these in succession to say to you that there is a single corporation that builds these. There's a single corporation and location from which New Mexico buys them. Nobody will tell me who and nobody will tell me how much. Please notice, uh, if not already, the grass, the barbecue, etc., and so forth. So every state has its own set of rules of how to how conjugal visits are organized. And in the state of New Mexico, Alice King, who was the wife of the governor at the time of the 1980 riot, really promoted the idea of conjugal visits. They did not exist prior to the riot in New Mexico. Uh, it is a multi-step program. The first, you, want, you must have one year without any, any you know, disciplinary record or write-up of any kind. One full year. Your first visit is six hours. Your second visit is 12 hours. Your third visit is 12 hours. Then you are allowed a 24-hour visit. All, there's four months in between each one of these visits. It is all on the discretion of the warden. And every time you have a visit, if the inmate is charged a $25 cleanup fee. Very few people make it to the 24 hours, and you're often very close to release. Um, the person who's the Secretary of Corrections in the state of New Mexico is a man named Greg Marcantel. And on May 1, 2014, Greg Marcantel put a stop to all conjugal visits in the state of New Mexico. All of these buildings are unutilized. What Mr. Marcantel said in issuing this statement and when speaking to the press was, conjugal visits were producing unwanted children spreading sexually transmitted diseases, and being used to introduce contraband in the prison. I did the data, 80% of all visits were parents and siblings. So, um, this is inside, they all look pretty similar. Uh, this is inside at a male facility. This is inside the, the conjugal visit trailers, or family visit trailers, as some people call them, in the women's prison. Um, I have pictures of everything, but I, I I want to point out to you these were the only, it was only at the women's prison that there was anything for children. Mm -hmm. uh, this is also inside the, at the women's prison, inside the conjugal visit trailer. This is <coughs> close up. This is in Springer, New Mexico. Corrections officers are doing time too, eight or 12 hour shifts at a time. And we often forget that prisons are sites of paid labor. The work of corrections tells an economic history of place and locates prison in the broader story of labor and economics in the United States. Um, the prison is down the road, uh, if I went this way. This is the only job with health insurance and security for 200 miles in every direction. I met people who drove over two hours to get to work. That is inside a corrections officer's uh, office. He is an STIU uh, officer, that means security threat intelligence unit. Inside the prisons are gang units, specialized intelligence gang units uh, that the correction officers, uh, it's considered prestigious, correction officers want that position. They have a, a lot of um, pride in that. The correction officer told me the toughest gang in New Mexico's prisoners are the officers. <laughs> that meant to him, but it's important for him to tell me. Um, so this is a painting done by a prisoner. The frame is around it. There are no windows in this office. Um, that is where a correction officer with a weapon sits. This is over a gymnasium, and the people will engage in basketball or whatever uh, athletic or exercise uh, they might be engaging in, and a correction officer will be there with the weapon. If the warden feels that the prison is calm, that's not necessary. If things feel tense, the correction officer will be sent there with a the weapon. There are close to one million correction officers in the United States. They're working class people who pay a very high price for us to have prisons and to have a steady paycheck. Correctional officers have high turnover rates. 
50% of every of, of the correction officers at every New Mexico prison are gone in one year. So the turnover is extraordinary. What that means for the prison is quite intense as well. Correction officers have high incidences of alcohol abuse, high incidences of domestic violence, and truncated lifespans. Studies show that they often hide their jobs. They don't tell people what they do for a living. Um, and with the decline of manufacturing in the United States, many politicians and communities have turned to prison in the hope of revitalizing local economies. The data are clear. Prisons deter other industries, and the jobs they bring are unsustainable with attendant social problems that weigh heavily on communities. The story of prisons is the story of disappearing jobs across the United States. New Mexico has 1,000 correction officers. They are mandated to do two to three overtimes a week. They cannot turn it down. Um, there's lots of pep talk kind of text all over prisons, talking to people that work there, and both the publics and the private. This is a private prison. Uh, Z, the Zia symbol is uh, a symbol of uh, a certain tribe where it has become, the state used it as the state symbol. And uh, so it's a Zia, and we see it a lot around the prisons, uh, as well as everywhere else in New Mexico, just like Coco Pelli. Um, but there's lots of like, be bold, be proud, whatever, and it's not only in the private prisons. This is CCA's, uh, this is plastered all over CCA's prisons. I just want to point one thing out to you, and you can enjoy the photos as you want, but they have to be good stewards of our customers' interests, and they absolutely understand their customers to be the state of New Mexico and us. We are their customers, that's how they would talk about it. This is, at, uh, this is public, this is in the main offices of the Department of Corrections in the state of New Mexico. Courage, responsibility, ethics, and dedication, cred, it's everywhere, it's on all kinds of walls. And you can't see the whole thing up here, but it's, it's uh, taking good care of the people of New Mexico by doing the right thing always, that is their motto. So food is a very big deal in prisons for all kinds of reasons. These are dead man trays. So every prison in New Mexico is mandated to keep a sample of every single item served for 72 hours. If somebody falls ill, this is immediately tested. These are in every walk-in or refrigerator in every prison in Mexico, and everybody refers to them as the dead man trays. So these are the dead man trays of one prison, another prison, Another prison. I'm inside a walk-in, so. This is how you eat. And um, I don't know what, what folks here um, have assumed about the budget, but often when I talk to people, they think food is a big part of a prison budget. It makes up 8% of a prison budget, and over 50% of what inmates eat, they buy at the commissary with their own money. In the state of New Mexico, each meal is priced out at $1.50. However, that number is elevated because there are people with diabetes or have special dietary needs, and those meals cost more, so it jacks up the overall price per meal, but in fact, so it's much less than 150. This is, you would put your tray through there. This is so the people inside serving you cannot see who they're serving, and the people getting their food cannot see who is serving them, because that is seen as a site of possible contention. You gave me this, you gave me that, and uh, uh, so this is, this is another prison, this is a male prison, so they put these up after the, the warden decided people shouldn't see who's serving them, they shouldn't see who's giving you food. So it's literally, like I've seen the meals and I've participated in them, hams are just like these disembodied hams um, um, moving through, so it's quite, quite something. They had to redo the prison kitchen, it certainly wasn't big enough, and um, most prisons are overcrowded, they could not stop serving, so the, prison, the kitchen was in full operation and under total reconstruction. That's after a meal. The state of New Mexico, and these are based on federal mandates, is required. So the kinds of things that constitute prisoner rights are often not about your individual rights, but a minimal standard of conditions that the prison must provide, and also in thinking of security for the institution. All prisons must keep two weeks' worth of food on site all the time, so if there's no deliveries and nobody goes in and nobody goes out, they can be perfectly functional for two weeks. All prisons have a generator, they have backup electricity. I was in a prison and we had the monsoons and all the electricity went out, the generator kicked in, it's like nothing happened. Every Department of Corrections has somebody who's in charge of PR. 
And if you're head of corrections in the state, whether you're the secretary or commissioner, whatever your title is, you have one mandate, and it's keep the prisons out of the news. I want to hear about them, I don't want anybody to hear about them, we never want to hear about them. So this, this made people very nervous, and they revoked my access. And uh, I got very freaked out, and I called in a few favors, and I drove up to Santa Fe, and I put on what my mentor calls a felony suit, so what you would wear if you were being charged with a felony and you wanted the judge to think well of you. So I put on my felony suit, and I went there, and what I discovered was a few things. Some people just need to say no. They actually don't need to stop you, they need to say no. So I needed, he needed to say no to me. He was the second in charge, the secretary refused to meet with me. I did say to somebody who was high up, I said, I hate to go to the press and say that you wouldn't let a professor at a land grant university do this intellectual project. Let's not get there, right? Let's, I think we can figure something out, right? And he was like, yeah. So then I went to see this top guy. He was six foot three, over 300 pounds. He was huge, and he needed me to sit in his office and feel small and he, um, experience his benevolence by letting me do this. And I, I, that was a new approach for me, and I learned a lot. Like, it didn't cost me anything. It was no big deal to me. And so, um, and then he sent me to the next one, like three rungs, so this the third in charge of all, all the state's prisons, and all the wardens answer to him. So he has to send the memo and let all the wardens know, I'm gonna come. And he's starting to say, well, I don't know if I want you to go here, I don't want you to go there. Let me tell you why that's so strange. There are no secrets in prison. Everybody is watching everything all the time. There is technology recording everything 24 hours a day, every single day. There, all there are is eyes watching everything. So the idea that documenting it or me coming in with the camera is problematic is actually absurd. But nonetheless, it's unheard of, right? So, but so he's like, well, I don't know if you should go here. I don't know if you should go there. And I said, you know what? You work so hard. You so I don't want to be uh, added work for anyone. Why don't I write the memo that goes to the wardens and you just have to send it out? Because I don't. He was like, great. So aha, uh -huh, that was a brilliant moment on my part. And um, I wrote the first paragraph had like every PhD word. I think I made words up. And um, I knew nobody would get to the second paragraph. And in fact, every prison I got to, nobody had read the memo. What they had seen was who it was sent by. And it was sent by the third in command. And so they were like, she goes anywhere she wants. One correction officer was with me at every prison, was really into me, took me everywhere. But however, the Santa Fe Penitentiary is over dozens and dozens and dozens of acres. There's many different prisons. So I'm in a correction officer vehicle, and he stops. I was like, I want to take pictures. So I'm out in the grounds, and I'm taking pictures. And I must have showed up on a camera on like the six different prisons on site. So four or five trucks barrel out of somewhere and they're about to tackle me, all these guys. And there's a guy who's been driving me around, he's a lieutenant, and he goes, higher pay grade than yours, boys. Higher pay grade than yours. And they were like, where do you want to go, man? I was like, wow, okay, this is crazy. So, um, but if you want to go up to the tower, you want to go here? Um, that was amazing. And I will say every warden I met was like, there's no secrets here. You can photograph anything. I went into mission control, everything. Nobody cared because they understood everybody sees everything and there's really no need to hide anything. But it is an interesting question about whose eyes, what does it mean to have a permanent record, um, these kinds of questions, I, I guess, uh, are evoked by the question of the camera. But everyone was stunned. The camera? The camera? The camera? So it's very interesting. Prisons are not... Oz is bullshit. Um, prisons are not, there's not ongoing violence. There's, prisons are boring and disgusting and, and dull and empty, arid, inhumane physical places. They're not like, you know, gangs running amok and, you know, all kinds of blood. There was a fight uh, one day and, you know, and all the officers and they were like, you want some blood pictures? And I was like, I'm good. But um, I, I, I deliberately didn't want to make those kinds of pictures. I don't want to traffic in. I think everybody has a prison narrative in the United States. We have a, an overall popular prison narrative. Prisons are necessary for public safety. Prisons are dangerous. The people in there are violent or more violent or differently violent than those of us that are not in there. And that um, these are like these, you know, exotic, dangerous places. And it's very important to me not to create images or tell a story that is that. That is not, I have never, ever, ever been afraid in a prison, ever. Um, uh, 
They're, they're spaces that invite and encourage people to be predatory, and you and I would be predatory if we were there, either as a correction officer or as an inmate, but we might be predatory for silence, where's the quiet space? You might be predatory in looking for writing materials, or if you're a visual artist, of what you can use to make your visual art, or food, um, and uh, so, yes, there's pecking orders and people are wrestling for places in that. Um, and certainly every corrections department has a culture. And you know, so what happened in Rikers was about a long-standing culture that had been happening there. And in different states, in different times in history, they've had that culture. But mostly prisons are really, really boring and they're vile. They're mean. They're mean spaces. They're mean institutions.